Imagine getting early in on crypto, investing your hard-earned cash into this asset class, making some handsome profits, and then boom, one day you get wiped out completely because you got hacked. Well, sadly, this happens all the time in crypto. I have personally been hacked myself, and the bad guys are getting even more creative in how they're doing this. And I don't want this to happen to you. So in this video, I'm going to talk about some of the most common ways that people get hacked in crypto right now in 2024 and how to avoid them. I'm going to talk about all this as a blockchain developer myself who works this technology on a daily basis. So if you're new around here, hey, I'm Gregory, and on this channel, I turn you into a blockchain master. So if that's something that you're interested in, then smash that like button down below and subscribe. And if you want to take advantage of all the insane opportunity that's happening in crypto right now, then the absolute best way to do that is to increase your income by becoming a blockchain developer and I can show you how to do that step by step from start to finish over at dappydiversity.com forward slash bootcamp. All right, so let's get into this. So like I was saying at the top of this video, the only true way to make it in crypto is if you're able to safely hold your cryptocurrency over a long period of time without losing it. And that's not true if you get hacked, because the last thing you want to do is lose your seat on a rocket ship as it's taking off. And we're seeing all kinds of new ways that people are getting hacked lately. One of the latest ones is people losing millions of dollars over a social engineering scheme where McDonald's Instagram was hacked and promoted a fake coin which got rug pulled. And so if this can happen to the biggest brands in the world, it can definitely happen to you if you don't protect yourself. And I want to help. I'm going to lay out some strategies that you can use in this video today. Some of these things I've personally learned the hard way after being in crypto for seven plus years, and I don't want them to happen to you. Now, a quick disclaimer, there's no one size fits all approach to just securing yourself from every single angle. In crypto, there's pros and cons to each strategy, which I'll lay out when I talk about those. I can't tell you exactly what to do in this video, but I can present you with some good options and you can pick up the best thing that works for you. So let's dive in. All right. So first of all, let's talk about the question of where should you hold your long term crypto? Because there's lots of different options for this and there's lots of different pros and cons for each strategy. So let's get into each of those. So one of them is to basically just hold your funds on a centralized cryptocurrency exchange. Something like Kraken, Binance, Coinbase, et cetera, et cetera. Okay, now this is a, a route that a lot of people go down. So what are the pros and cons? Well, the pros of this strategy are that it kind of works like a bank where you just log in, you have a username and password, they're custodying your crypto for you, and then you can connect it to your bank account to on-ramp and off-ramp out of crypto, and you can withdraw into the crypto ecosystem, and somebody else is basically just taking care of the problem for you. Now, that's exactly where the cons come into play, which is someone else is custodying your funds. This is what's called a third-party custody solution. And it, you've probably heard all the time in crypto, you know, not your keys, not your crypto. So the downside of this is that if something ever happens to this exchange, if it goes insolvent, then basically, you know, you could lose all your money, just like we've seen with the FTX disaster in 2022. And another big downside of this strategy is that you know, your exchange could get hacked and you could have all your funds drained off of it. I'll talk about some ways of how to mitigate that because most people are still using centralized exchanges for some purpose, even if they're not holding their long-term crypto there. So those are the downsides, but why would you even want to do this in the first place, long-term hold crypto on a centralized exchange? Well, it's because you don't have to self-custody which has a lot of problems associated, which I'll talk about in the next sections. All right, so now let's talk about self-custody options. So what does this mean? Well, basically it means that you are taking full ownership over your crypto. You are holding it on the blockchain. You're not letting anybody else touch it. Now this has some benefits and it also has some downsides as well. Let's start off with one of the first most popular ways to self-custody, which is basically to just hold it in a digital crypto wallet, something like MetaMask, something like Phantom, if you're using Solana. There's lots of different different, you know, crypto wallets out there. So let's talk about some of the pros of this. Well, you are custom your own crypto. Like I said before, not your keys, not your crypto. You don't have to worry about an exchange going insolvent. You don't have to worry about a bad guy stealing your password or breaching the security measures of the exchange and absconding with your funds. You don't have to worry about like seizure of your assets from somebody else. These are all the types of benefits you get from holding and custodying your own crypto. It does come with some downsides because when it's your responsibility, it's all on your shoulders not to make some really specific mistakes. Because in sometimes you actually can be your own worst enemy. So how is that possible? Well, first of all is wallet recovery with a seed phrase. Okay, so what is a seed phrase? Well, basically, 
It is a string of words that's used to back up your crypto wallet. Usually it's a 12 word phrase called a mnemonic that's in a specific order. And you basically have to type these words in to regenerate your wallet. Or you can export your private keys as a long string. So what are the problems potentially with this seed phrase model? Well, basically you've got to back your seed phrase up because what happens if your computer got stolen, okay? And you no longer had access to your wallet. Or let's say you keep your wallet on your phone. What if every single device that you had was lost? What happens if your dwelling burned down in a fire and you lost access to digital access? Well, you could still restore that wallet using the seed phrase. It's got nothing to do with the device itself. But you have a problem here, which is you've got to store that seed phrase somewhere securely. And people do this the wrong way all the time. You know, pretty much every time you generate a wallet, you see this thing that's like, hey, here's your seed phrase. Make sure you back it up somewhere, put it in a secure location. But people make mistakes of taking a picture of it, okay? Keeping it on their phone, thinking that no one's ever going to find that. Well, what they don't know is a lot of times that your phone's automatically putting, you know, pictures in the cloud, whether you know it or not. We've seen iCloud get breached in the past. This could happen to you. Your seed phrase could be exposed. And as long as somebody sees that picture, they don't care whose wallet it is. They're just going to generate the wallet and clean out all the funds and you might be empty. Okay, so you don't want to do that. Never take a picture of your seed phrase, whether you think it's stored in your computer, in the cloud, et cetera, et cetera. Also, you never want to store your seed phrase in digital form in plain text on your computer. Like don't put it in a note, don't put it in Dropbox, don't put it on Drive, whatever. The most common thing people do with seed phrases is they write them on physical paper, they etch them into metal, and they store them in secure locations, usually redundant locations in case something happens to one of the seed phrases is destroyed by disaster in one location. Okay, so that's what it's about seed phrases. You have to be able to recover your funds by regenerating your wallet with the seed phrase, but you have to store that seed phrase in a very secure way or somebody else could find it and they could ultimately clean you out. So another problem with using a wallet like MetaMask or Phantom is that basically it's single single factor authentication, which basically means as long as you can log into your wallet, you're logged in and anybody's logged in and can click a button could authorize a transaction on your behalf, okay? So this has a problem. What if you sign you know, a message on a website you didn't mean to, or you, somebody screen shared onto your device and opened your wallet and then clicked a button to send all the crypto out of it? Well, that's where hardware wallets come into play. Okay, there's lots of different reasons why you might want to use a hardware wallet, but that solves this specific problem. So hardware wallets are basically a device that you plug into your computer where it stores the private key or the seed phrase, you know, for your wallet. It's not just an app on your computer, it's on this device and you must connect this device to a computer and basically use it as two-factor authentication anytime you want to make a transaction on the blockchain. So if the device is not connected online, nobody can you know, get into it anyway. This does as a nice step of security for other people because they have to have this physical device in order to you know, make transactions. But there are a few problems with hardware wallets, okay? So problem number one is hardware wallets often give people a false sense of security. They think that basically if they have this device, there's no way in the world that they can get hacked or, you know, scammed out of their money somehow. So what are some ways that you could still potentially um, lose your crypto even if you have a hardware wallet? Well, there's a couple ways. Way number one is even if you have a hardware wallet, you still have to back up the seed phrase for the device. And so if you make any of the mistakes I talked about before, with backing up your seed phrase, then it doesn't matter if somebody has the hardware wallet, if they have the seed phrase, they can still clean you out, okay? So the other thing is, if you have a hardware wallet and you go into a website and you sign a malicious transaction, even if you authorize it on the hardware wallet, it's still going to be a malicious transaction submitted to the blockchain and you could lose your money. Well, for example, we see like malicious approval messages that people don't know what they're signing, which could clean you out. I'll actually save that for a later point in the video. All right, so the last way I want to talk about, which is probably going to be the least popular for most people, is cold storage. So basically what that is, is it is, um, it means a lot of different things, but ultimately what it means is a crypto wallet that doesn't really touch the internet unless you're going to just finally clean that thing out. Because that's how I define cold storage. Basically the idea is, you have a wallet that's never going to make transactions online, therefore it's offline or cold storage. And eventually you have to connect that device to line online because you're going to eventually take funds out of it. But what I typically say is you don't 
you, you don't take funds out of it until you're ready to just basically deprecate the wallet, move everything out. So what are some options for this? Well, you actually can get cold storage devices, but one of the most common ways is just generate a key pair, a private key, uh, and save it somewhere in a very secure location and send funds to that particular address and never touch it until you're ready to withdraw the funds, okay? Now, obviously this, the downsides with this are you have to back up that private key or seed phrase or whatever you use for this wallet, just like you did with the other methods that I'm talking about before, make sure that it's very safe and nobody can steal it. All right, so now I want to revisit a topic that I promised I would get back to previously in the video, which is basically operational security if you're using things like you know, cryptocurrency exchanges, centralized exchanges, or your bank accounts, and even your primary email address or whatever you use to register for these types of accounts. Um, so basically, what you have to understand is you need to be you need to be very good operational security if you're in crypto because anybody that can hack a specific password or just exploit a weakness in your security plan could really clean you out. So the first basic rule of thumb here is if you have multiple accounts, let's say an email address, a cryptocurrency exchange account, uh, a bank account, you want all three of those things to have different passwords in the very least. I mean, ideally they have different email addresses, but most people aren't going to do that. At the very least, what you can do is have multiple different passwords, unique passwords, strong passwords, passwords that you really shouldn't probably even be able to memorize very easily because those will be the strongest and most random. And so you might say, well, well, how do I keep up with all these different passwords? Well, there's different password management tools like LastPass, 1Password. Obviously, those are going to have some trade-offs with them in terms of security, but why would you want to do this? Well, basically, the whole idea is if somebody figured out, you know, your email address that you use to register for everything and its password, and you use that same login key pair for, you know, your cryptocurrency exchange account and then your bank account, if you don't have two-factor authentication on, they can do anything they wanted to on those accounts, assuming they can bypass the other security measures like circumvent, you know, the, the platform's basic security checks like a new IP address that's irregular from what it normally does. So that's the first thing though, is unique passwords on all centralized sites like this. So number two is having some type of two-factor authentication. Okay, so what does that mean? Again, so a two-factor authentication password is the first factor. Second factor is having a different way besides your password to prove that you can log into the account. Now, what you do not want to do is use text messaging for this or SMS two-factor authentication. I mean, you, you can, but let me tell you what the severe downside risks of this. So uh, basically, you can get SIM swap. So what does this mean? Well, basically, it means that someone could get a copy of your SIM card, put it into a phone. Now they have access to your phone number. And if they have your password, and they may not even need your password because what they can do is they can just do a password reset request. If you have two-factor authentication on, they confirm it with your phone, they reset your password, they log into your email address, they log into your, they can reset any you know, account because now they have your email address and they can log into everything and they can potentially clean out your crypto. So how might somebody do that? Well, you know, we, we've seen SIM swaps happen a lot. People can call up phone companies, you know, tend to basically be somebody who's in distress, like they have a screaming child in the background and get really impatient and or have some type of medical hardship. And sometimes you'll get people who are very loose and will just give them a new SIM card and they, they can clean you out. So be forewarned about two-factor authentication with SMS. So if you're not going to do that, what are some of the options? Well, there's lots of different things. You can use two-factor authentication apps um, where basically you get a code that's generated like every 30 or 60 seconds or whatever based off of a seed that's provided from each service that you're logging into. And this can kind of give you that one-time password code that you need. Okay, that's a really popular option. Typically, you want to have this on a different device than what you normally log into you to use these services. There's also the option of having a hardware device that's used as two-factor authentication, things like YubiKeys. Okay, it's basically a little device you plug in your computer, you just touch it anytime you want to authorize a transaction and that's your second factor, which is having a physical tap. All right, so finally, let's talk about one of the lesser known ways that people get hacked, which this isn't really a hack so much as it's getting scammed out of your crypto. So there's lots of different ways to essentially get scammed at, from by, by thinking you're doing something in crypto and then you, you lose your money, okay, through social engineering, through different means. So just like I was talking about at the beginning of this video, you know, McDonald's Instagram account was hacked and, you know, they posted a fake coin, okay, that was eventually rug pulled later. So one, one pretty simple rule of thumb here is if something just looked really weird, like if you see McDonald's launch a coin, 
and you're like, hmm, maybe I should put some money in here. Don't do it, right? Like, just wait. Because, like, what if you're like, oh, well, it's just a small amount of money. It doesn't matter. Well, what if in trying to put in a small amount of money, you accidentally lose all your crypto because you were trying to interact with a malicious smart contract that took all your money out of your wallet? Which brings me on to my next step, which is signing malicious transactions. So it's pretty common, right? When you go to a, a crypto site, and you sign a transaction, you have really no idea what that transaction is going to do for sure until you click that confirm button. Your wallet might give you a preview, but sometimes you just get this gobbledygook text, especially if you're using a hardware wallet, where you don't actually know what's going to happen on the other side, okay? So that's one way that, you know, having some technical sophistication and being a developer can actually save your life in crypto because you can actually go look at the smart contracts you're interacting with and know what the functions are going to do whenever you call them. But also when you're using Ethereum and other EVM compatible chains, one of the most common ways people get rug pulled is through approval attacks. So basically anytime you like sell an NFT or anytime you trade a token, right? You have to sign an approval transaction before that goes through. Now, sometimes people don't realize it, but they're approving the wrong tokens or they're approving the tokens for the wrong person to spend them with the wrong amounts. So you might think, oh, I'm gonna go buy this thing what you don't know you're doing is actually assigning an approval transaction for potentially all the coins in your wallet to somebody else. And then they can just go spend all your coins on your behalf. And you didn't know you're going to do that. So that's why you have to be wary of scams like this that might put that in front of you. That's not what this scam did, but that's what they could have done or other scams that try to do the same type of thing. And always you have to be careful of things like people DMing you on social media, pretending to be somebody else, maybe somebody well-known, or maybe somebody you know, try to get you to send their crypto. Same thing with phishing emails, people pretending to be your bank or you know a cryptocurrency exchange that you use, or somebody you know, or somebody influential. Basically, the rule of thumb is anytime you're gonna sign a transaction or send crypto somewhere, just stop, slow down, really think it through slowly about what could happen if you follow these steps and just wait before you confirm that transaction. All right, so that's an overview of some of the most common pitfalls when it comes to custing your own crypto and also getting hacked in this space. So again, I don't want these things to happen to you. So here's some ways that you can protect yourself. So I hope you like this video. Let me know what you think down in the comment section below. What's your favorite way to secure your crypto? And whenever you're finished leaving your comment, make sure you smash that like button down below and subscribe. And while you can definitely make some long-term money in the crypto space, you obviously have to hold on to it in order to make it. But the absolute best way to make it is to increase your income by becoming a blockchain developer. And I can share to do that step-by-step from start to finish over at dappadiversity.com forward slash bootcamp. You really don't have to be an expert to get started today. I've helped people with zero coding experience become real-world blockchain developers in a matter of months. So that's all I've got. Until next time, thanks for watching Dappy Diversity.